Hello, 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 and welcome to Miss Hope's Reading Hour. So sorry for my tardiness, friends. It was not my fault. I will let you know it was not me, okay? For whatever reason, something is going on with my other computer. So I had to scramble and get my second computer that I use for school just so I could come on and do the reading hour today, okay? Um, and then I realized I had went over the time and then my Facebook friends would not have been able to see the reading hour because it has like the little yellow triangle with the exclamation point. And it's like, yeah, you waited too long to start the broadcast. So, uh, the Facebook friends will not be able to see. We can't have that. We have to have everybody here to see the reading hour, okay? So I am here now and I am very glad to be here. And I am glad that you are here on this wonderful Wednesday. Hopefully you had a wonderful Wednesday. Today in Philadelphia, it was a very mild day. I believe it got up to about, well, what they said was 56 degrees. So I was like, you know what? When it's time for the kids in virtual school to go on lunch, I am going to go outside and just stand up outside. And I did. And I was like, oh, this feels so good. The sun felt good on my skin. The breeze felt good, even though it was a little bit chilly, because of course it is still February. So it felt a little cool when there was a breeze, but the sun and the weather felt awesome. And almost all of the snow is gone from in front of my house. Maybe that's the way it is where you are too. So hopefully my friends, my young ones who were in virtual school, that you got to go outside a little bit, run around, get some fresh air and have a little fun after school was over, maybe on your lunch break. Hopefully my older young ones like me, you got to go outside during your lunch break and just <sighs> breathe in some fresh air, okay? Well, my friends, we are here for the wonderful Wednesday broadcast of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. And if you saw the teaser earlier today, we are still in Happy Black History Month, everybody. Remember I told you, I'm going to keep saying it because we're still there. Happy Black History Month. So today we are going to read some books about some very strong Black African American, whichever one you want to use, women. We are going to read about two of them today. So, like I said, I have a lot of other books, and I was like, oh, I'm not gonna get to read them all. But next month is Women's History Month. So, guess what? I'll be able to read some of those then too. But we're just gonna talk about two today. And of course, since it is still Love Month. If you notice, you see my little earrings, my little hearts. I wore them just for book number three. So remember, we do not have a chapter book yet. I apologize, I didn't put up the voting for you all to vote for the two chapter books. I will remind you of them though at the end of Miss Hope's reading hour. Now, before we get into the books, let's go over our disclaimer the wonderful music that you hear, and the books that we will read today. Unfortunately, Miss Hope's Reading Hour does not own the rights to any of them, but, 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 they are here for your listening and reading enjoyment. And if you take a look down at the ticker, please take an opportunity to donate to the Miss Hope's Reading Hour library. I would like to try to count how many books we've read so far since last April. We're almost up on our one year anniversary in the middle of April of this year. Um, 
but we always need books because as soon as I get a shipment, I start reading them. And now this week, we've been reading three new books a day because we're waiting a little bit on um, the new chapter books so if you guys can have a vote. So please take an opportunity donate or via cash app or by sending a digital gift card um, to our email address or getting in touch with me if you want to send books directly to me okay now let us get to the books our first book that we will be reading today is called lift as you climb the story of Ella Baker. Lift as you climb. This book is by Patricia Kruby Powell and R. Gregory Christie, a Caldecott Honor winner. Lift as you climb. The story of Ella Baker. We will be reading that today, and this is an elder. No, I'm sorry, a McEller Mc. Eldery Books book. Let me not mess up people's names. You know, Miss Hope sometimes trying to get it right makes a little mistake. Our next book that we will be reading is called Shirley Chisholm is a Verb. Shirley Chisholm is a Verb. This book is written by Veronica Chambers, illustrated by Rachelle Baker. Shirley Chisholm is a verb. You know a verb's an action word, right? And for our love book, we will be reading Honey, I Love. This book is by Eloise Greenfield. Illustrations by Jan Spivey Gilchrist. Honey, I Love. And we'll find out who... Oh, this is an Amistad book, an imprint of Harper Collins Publishers. Honey, I love. Now, my friends, let us get into our first book, okay? Lift as you climb. The story of Ella Baker. Let's take that off. You know what? I am appreciating all these books whose dust jacket and the front of the book look the same. I am appreciating all of that. You know how Miss Hope loves that. Let's read about Miss Ella Baker. I think I may have heard her name before, but I don't know anything about her. So this is another one of those instances where we're both learning something new together. I always love those moments where we're learning something new together. Oh, and this, I, I believe this book has some questions for you to answer. All right. Under a bright North Carolina sun, Ella rode to church with her granddaddy and mama. When granddaddy Mitchell stood to preach, Ella sat in the deacon's chair, legs ruler straight, ears soaking up his strong voice. He preached, give to others. He preached, join together. He spoke, freedom. He asked, what do you hope to accomplish? After church at Granddaddy's farm, the farm he and Grandma worked as slaves, the farm they toiled on like mules after emancipation till they bought and owned it, where Ella played catch ball with her cousins until Grandma said, dinner time. And afterwards, listen, back when we were slaves, Master said, bet you marry light-skinned Carter. I said, no how. Master, also my daddy, 
made me plow the swamp to break me. After turning the muck, I went and jumped the broom, married. Proud, dark-skinned Mitchell, your granddaddy, and danced all night long. Ella drank up that story till it filled her bones. She listened to the neighbors tell about chopping cotton. Many still lived in shacks, worked white people's land like her grandparents had back in slave days. On their land, her grandparents raised vegetables, hogs, and cows. On their land, they built a church and a school. Church said, help your neighbor. Mama said, lift as you climb. When Ella was about 10, Mama said, Ella, help the neighbors. Ella rounded up the motherless children, dragged them home, dumped them, scrubbed them, dressed them in clean clothes, returned them to their grateful daddy. Ella harvested peas. After her family ate their fill, she took a peck of peas to the neighbors. When strangers came over, Ella stoked the fire, warmed the food, served it. At 14, Ella set off for boarding school in Raleigh, high school and college at Shaw University, top of her class. Worked as a waitress to pay her way. After she graduated, Ella moved to New York City. She asked herself, what do I hope to accomplish? She would lift as she climbed. She joined voices that demanded, don't buy where you can't work. Negroes needed jobs. White shop owners needed Negroes to buy from their shops or they'd close. Without jobs, without money, Negroes couldn't buy from white shops. Ella and other colored people told the shop owners just so. Some whites hired a few blacks, they needed each other. Ella fought for that step forward toward justice. She fought for rights. She fought for her people. She got a job, job with the NAACP. Just how they say, the NAACP. They raised money to fight racial injustice in the courts by selling memberships and registering voters. The NAACP focused on finding members in the Negro elite, preachers, doctors, businessmen. But Ella had a different idea. She'd find a church, get herself invited, talk at Sunday service, make friends with everyday people, middle-class maids, shop workers, and poor sharecroppers, not just the elite, and ask, what do you hope to accomplish? That's a powerful question. She listened in Mims, Florida. Our school principal asked for teacher's pay equal to white teacher's pay. Whites dynamited his house, killed him. Ella mourned, that then said, you want equal pay for Negroes? Register to vote. Choose your representative. They will listen to your complaint. That representative will fight for the Negro. All over the South, 
Ella made speeches about freedom, voting, rights, words straight from her heart to the hearts of her audience. Then she'd ask, what do you hope to accomplish? In one Virginia town, people objected to police brutality. Why'd the police beat Negroes when they hadn't committed a crime? Another town wanted better teacher salaries and school buses. Another, use of city parks and playgrounds. They wanted fair treatment, but the Negro middle class resisted joining the NAACP and getting the vote. Why anger their white bosses? risk their jobs, their comforts. Why risk being hungry? That is quite the catch 22. Ella told this story. Across the tracks, the poor lived in filth and great disease, and, I'm sorry. The poor lived in filth and get diseases. Those diseases hop those itty bitty tracks and infect you. That made sense to the middle class. All Negroes were in this together. They'd have to risk angering their bosses. Ella and her new friends, workers, partners, believers, mostly women, walked into bars and grills, schools, beer gardens, boot black parlors. She was always the poised lady always Miss Baker posing the question, what do you hope to accomplish? The people wanted freedom. Martin Luther King Jr. and 100 men, mostly preachers, and Ella worked together for black freedom they formed the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Churches worked with preachers at the top, handing down knowledge from the pulpit to the flock. That's how these preachers wanted to work now, like their churches did, from the top down. Ella worked from the bottom up, from the grassroots. She wanted people to solve their own problems like her mother taught her, lifting as she climbed. But the powerful men weren't used to women working in their inner circle. Ella listened to the people, then raised their questions with the preachers. Shouldn't we harness the power of black women as leaders? Shouldn't we train local leaders? Shouldn't we create education programs? Those are all very good questions. She challenged Reverend King with her ideas. Rather than just the elite in the middle class, what about the poorest? What about the people at the bottom? Dr. King didn't always agree with Ella, but he respected her. He said, Ella must head up our new organization, the SCLC to register voters, stand up to whites. His order came from the top down. Ella thought he should ask, he should ask, not command. Still, she agreed for the cause. For the freedom movement, she'd empower people to take action. She'd register voters. Oh. Then something amazing happened. Negro students sat at whites only lunch counters. They wanted to be served hamburgers alongside white people in the store where they bought school supplies in Greensboro, Nashville. Greensboro, Nashville, Atlanta, Durham, sit-ins exploded throughout the South. Ella had never been so excited.
She brought the students together at a conference at Shaw University. She wanted them to organize. A united swell of voices was more powerful than individual voices. They asked her advice, always the teacher. She asked them, what do you hope to accomplish? They wanted to register voters. They wanted to stage sit-ins. They named themselves the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the SNCC, or SNCC for short. Students staged sit-ins. Some got whipped or spat on. They sat quietly responding with nonviolence. Many were jailed. Ella listened and comforted them, brought toothbrushes and soap to their cells. She advised them, lift as you climb. The students ventured back into the fight armed with Ella's wisdom. Tennessee tenant farmers, poor Negroes working for white plantation owners, hungry and bone tired from overwork, tried to register to vote. White bosses evicted them from their shacks, beat them for being bold. Now the sharecroppers lived in tents. The students asked them, what do you hope to accomplish? They wanted justice. They wanted to vote. They wanted to be treated like citizens. Ella worked alongside the students when they rode in battered school buses and commercial buses, testing the new integration laws by breaking old Jim Crow laws. They sat in whites only seats. They came south to help desegregate. In Alabama, the buses were firebombed. Students were beaten, jailed. Those freedom riders of 1961 woke up the nation. Wow, so brave. Ella had helped plan the rides. She advised the students in meetings on car trips over ice cream sundaes. At night, sharing tiny beds as the students brainstormed, connected, struggled to become their own leaders. Many of them women, when it was new to be a woman leading. Ella said, we are not fighting for the freedom of the Negro alone, but for the freedom of the human spirit. To her last days, Ella fought for freedom, lifting as she climbed. The seeds she sowed all her life continued to bear fruit today. She said, the struggle for rights didn't start yesterday and has to continue until it is one. What do you hope to accomplish? Wow. The end. I would read the author's note, but it's kind of long. But wow. What a powerful woman that Ella Baker, lifting as she climbed, always asking, what do you hope to accomplish? And that is a question for all of my young ones, all of us older young ones, with all of the things that we do, all the ways that we want to help people, all the things that we want to change in the world, in those things that we do and those changes that we want, what do we hope to accomplish? That is a question to ask yourself today. Maybe ask yourself that question every day. With all of the things you do, what do you hope to accomplish? What a powerful, powerful message.
from Miss Ella Baker. I'm so glad we got to learn about her together today. Something we shared together, we got to learn about her together. All right, for our next book, book Shirley Chisholm is a Verb by Miss Veronica Chambers. And yes, it looks the same underneath <laughs> the dust jacket. Switch that over there. Let's read about Miss Shirley Chisholm. Some words, when they connect with the right people, become almost like potions or spells. These words become magical. That's the way it was with Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm and verbs. She understood almost intuitively how and why verbs are not just words about being, but doing. Verbs are words that move the world forward. Shirley's family understood all about moving. Her mother was from Barbados, an island in the Caribbean. Her father was from Guyana, a country in South America. They moved to New York City, where Shirley was born. When Shirley was three, her mother sent her and her sisters to Barbados so that their parents could work more hours. Her mother cleaned houses and office buildings. Her father worked in a factory. They worked all day and all night because they dreamed of buying a home for their family in the United States. Wow. In Barbados, surrounded by her grandmother, aunts, and uncles, little Shirley worked hard too. Her classroom was noisy and the three teachers that shared the room needed to project to be heard above all the passionate students. But her teachers taught Shirley how to speak up and they helped her understand the power of words. Later she'd say, if I speak and read and write easily, that early education is the cause. Wow, three teachers with three classes sharing one room. I can only imagine how passionate those students were. When she was nine, Shirley and her sisters moved back from Barbados to Brooklyn. Everything in Brooklyn was different and Shirley missed the warm island weather. I bet she did. But Shirley loved indoor activities, like going to the movies and reading. Shirley was a voracious reader, much like her father. Shirley was also a dedicated student. And at her high school in Brooklyn, she was vice president of the Junior Arista Honor Society and graduated with a Medal of Excellence in French. She earned scholarships to both Vassar and Oberlin colleges but her parents could not afford the room and board. Shirley decided to go to Brooklyn College instead and live at home in the brownstones her parents were ultimately able to buy through their hard work. In college, Shirley decided to pursue a career in education. She became a nursery school teacher and then earned her master's degree. Completing her education was hard work, but it paid off. She directed daycare centers and became a consultant to the city on early education. She helped implement and organize a program called Head Start, which helps three and four year olds get ready for kindergarten. She's the reason for Head Start. But Shirley wanted to help even more people. She believed that service to others is the rent you pay for your room on earth. Oh, that is a good one. I want to read that again. 
She believed that service to others is the rent you pay for your room on earth. Oh, I love that. Which is another way to say she wanted to use her verbs and improve the lives of as many people as she could, just like her parents and her teachers had improved her own. Wow, that is a powerful saying. She decided to go into politics. She ran for and won a seat on the New York State Assembly. The assembly makes decisions for people all over the state of New York. She was one of the first people to argue that the New York State liter Literacy Test not be conducted only in English. New York was home to people from all over the world and Shirley thought that it was important to honor the native languages of all the state citizens. Her work in the New York state government, for her work in the New York state government, she was awarded the Salute to Women Doers Award. She was always a doer. Then Shirley ran for United States Congress the part of the government that makes decisions for people all over the country. It was a race few thought she could win, but Shirley believed if your heart told you it was the right thing to do, you should always listen. So she knew she could only fail if she didn't try. She campaigned, meaning that she encouraged people to vote for her. Her slogan was unbought and unbossed. She wanted the people to know that she would never choose money or power over what was important to them. She campaigned in both English and Spanish because she wanted as many people as possible to understand her message. In her speeches, she called herself fighting Shirley Chisholm because she wanted voters to know she wasn't afraid to stand up for what she believed in. The people of Brooklyn chose Shirley to represent them. She became the first black woman ever elected to Congress. Shirley traveled to Washington, DC there wasn't a single person who looked like her. It was, it was a lonely time. Being the first and only often is. But Shirley Chisholm wouldn't give up. She thought of all the people back in Brooklyn who had voted for her. She felt forever linked to them. Shirley's first assignment in Congress was the House Agriculture Committee, a group of people who oversee the farmlands of America. Shirley was disappointed. She came from a big city. How would working with farms help the people in Brooklyn who voted for her? She shared this question with her friend. He encouraged her to use her position on the committee to help feed the hungry all over including her beloved Brooklyn. Shirley helped to initiate a program called WIC, which assists women, infants, and children in need of food. Shirley also helped create the National School Lunch Program, but she didn't decide the menus. So if you don't like your lunch, <laughs> please don't blame her. Wow, so many of the things that she helped to create are still in existence today and still helping people. Because of her hard work, she eventually earned her dream job of helping students and workers through the Education and Labor Committee. Shirley said, you don't make progress by standing on the sidelines, whimpering and complaining. She said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. And Shirley wasn't just concerned about getting a seat at the table for herself. 
She never wanted to be the one and, o and the only. She helped create the Congressional Black Caucus so more African-Americans could be elected to serve in Washington, D.C. She wanted Congress to look like the America that had elected her. Not everyone in Washington applauded Shirley's wins. She was always more interested in serving people than in making laws that helped big business. The men on Capitol Hill who cared more about power and money said, go home, Shirley Chisholm. She replied, I'm fighting Shirley Chisholm. You can't wish me away. You just can't. She remembered her impassioned teachers and her hardworking parents. And it gave her the spirit and the spunk to challenge the old age old traditions. She said, I'm not afraid of anything or anybody. I know that's right fighting Shirley Chisholm. Shirley was so unafraid that in 1972, after four years in Congress, she decided to run for president. Before a large crowd of people, she announced, I stand before you today, a candidate for the presidency of the United States of America. She was the first black person and the first woman to make a serious bid for the presidency. She said, I am not the candidate for black America, although I am black and proud. I am not the candidate of the women's movement of this country, although I am a woman and I am equally proud of that. I am the candidate of the people of America. Shirley crisscrossed the nation, giving speeches, debating candidates on television and registering voters. She needed to convince the Democratic Party that she would be the best candidate for president. Wow, she, she was a powerful lady. People had called Shirley Chisholm many things before, but now they said she was black, beautiful, brave, brainy, bright, and believable. Some of the candidates were angry that Shirley was taking votes away from them. But Shirley knew how to hold her ground. She said, excuse me, I have a right to be here. Pay attention, I've got something to say. Listen, I've got a job to do and I intend to do it. When people tried to silence her, Shirley spoke louder. When the media ignored her, Shirley protested vigorously. When other politicians tried to bully her, Shirley stood stronger. When her opponents said hurtful things, Shirley smiled wider. <laughs> she surely did not scare easy. Then Shirley heard that the Democrats had decided that she would not be their presidential candidate. Shirley was disappointed, but not discouraged. Shirley realized that just because she didn't win, it didn't mean that she lost. During her presidential bid, she had gained more delegates than many in the party expected. With each delegate that voted for her, she put a crack in the ceiling that separated women and men of color from the highest seat in the nation, the presidency. Some races are relays. We only need run as far and as fast as we can. Shirley's verbs, her words, and her actions planted the seeds of possibility for others. Twelve years later, Geraldine Ferraro crack, would crack the ceiling further when she gained the Democratic nomination for vice president. Twenty-five years after that, President Barack Obama would ascend all the way to the White House. Seven years later, Hillary Rodham Clinton 
would put 18 million more cracks in that ceiling when the Democrats nominated her for president. Then in 2018, a record-breaking 131 women were elected to Congress. It was a number that would have made Shirley Beam. Part of the congressional class of 2018 was a young woman named Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Like Shirley, she was also known as the Congresswoman from New York. Like Shirley, Alexandria did things her way and she prioritized the people who had elected her and put their concerns first. Shirley Chisholm inspired her. On, the, on her first day in Congress, Alexandria said, from suffragettes to Shirley Chisholm, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the mothers of the movement. She informed the people in Washington that in the spirit of Shirley, she was fighting Alexandria and they couldn't wish her away. They couldn't. Wow. Shirley Chisholm once said, the next time a woman of whatever color or a dark skinned person of whatever sex aspires to be president, the way should be a little smoother because I helped pave it. It, always, it was always her intention to throw the doors of government wide open, and she did. When Shirley retired from Congress, after serving seven consecutive terms in office, she, would, she said she wanted to be known for her courage to stand up for herself and the people who had elected her. She said, I'd like to say that Shirley Chisholm had guts. In 2015, President Barack Obama awarded Shirley Chisholm the Medal of Freedom. Shirley's great nephew accepted the award on her behalf. Speaking of her service to the nation and how tireless she was in her quest, President Obama said, there are people in our country's history who don't look left or right, they look straight ahead. Shirley Chisholm was one of those people. Shirley Chisholm accomplished so much because she wore her verbs carefully. Learn, negotiate, listen, stand, campaign, invite, debate, inspire, speak, represent. It's your turn now. What verbs will you choose? Wow, what an amazing story. The end. Wow, Shirley Chisholm was absolutely a verb. She was a woman of action. I, and you know, even though I knew about Shirley Chisholm, we both learned some things today again together. I did not know she was responsible for Head Start. I didn't know she was responsible for WIC, Women, Infant, and Children, that helps to feed them. I didn't know she was responsible for the school lunch program. Amazing. And all of these things that she was in charge of are still in existence today and help millions of people. Shirley Chisholm is a verb. Oh. Man, both of these women, Ella Baker and Shirley Chisholm, were powerful people. And they left such an example for people to follow. That is amazing. I love those books. So for my parent friends, if any of your children still have a report to do for Black History Month, Shirley Chisholm is a verb, or lift as you climb the story of Ella Baker. 
wonderful stories and not the black history figures that you think about all the time, but they still had a very powerful impact, not just on African-Americans, but on this country, on everyone. Amazing stories. Now, my friends, for our love story, Honey, I Love by Eloise Greenfield. I love, I love a lot of things, a whole lot of things. Like, hmm, like what? Let's see. My cousin comes to visit and you know he's from the South because every word he says just kind of slides out of his mouth. <laughs> I love when my relatives and friends from the South talk too. I love their accent. I like the way he whistles and I like the way he walks. But honey, let me tell you that I love the way he talks. I love the way my cousin talks. And what else does she love? The day is hot and icky and the sun sticks to my skin. Mr. Davis turns the hose on. Everyone jumps right in. The water stings my stomach but I feel so nice and cool. Any kind of water spray is great on a summer day. Honey, let me tell you that I love a flying pool. I love the way, I'm sorry, I love to feel a flying pool and I never heard it called that when it's the hose or even um, the water plug, the flying pool. Renee comes out to play and brings her dolls without a dress. I make a dress with paper and, the, and that doll sure looks a mess. <laughs> that is creative though to use paper to make the poor doll a dress. We laugh so long and loud and hard that the doll falls to the ground. Honey, let me tell you that I love the laughing sound. I love to make the laughing sound. And what else do you love, honey? What else do you love? Let's see. My uncle's car is crowded. There's lots of food to eat. We're going down the country where the church folks like to meet. I have been in those car rides. <laughs> I'm looking out the window at the cows and trees outside. Honey, let me tell you that I love to take a ride. I love to take a family ride. And what else do you love? <laughs> my mama's on the my mama's on the sofa sewing buttons on my coat. I go and I sit beside her. I'm through playing with my boat. I hold her arm and kiss it because it feels so soft and warm. Honey, let me tell you that I love my mama's arm. I love to kiss my mama's arm. And honey, what else do you love? It's not so late at night, but still I'm lying in my bed. 
I guess I need my rest. At least that's what my mama said. <laughs> you guys never believe that you need your rest. She told me not to cry because she don't want to hear a peep. Honey, let me tell you, I don't love to go to sleep. I do not love to go to sleep. <laughs> I can think of a few kids who share your self sentiment. There's no parties happening, y'all. Everybody's going to sleep. But I love, I love a lot of things. A whole lot of things. <laughs> and honey, I love me too. <laughs> the end. What a good book, honey. I love. What kind of things do I love? Let me think. Honey, I love chocolate. I love chocolate a lot. Okay. Honey, I love art supplies, all kinds of art supplies, pencils and paint brushes and paints and papers of all kinds, as you can see, okay? <laughs> Honey, I love clouds and stars. I love looking up at the sky and seeing clouds of different kinds and looking up on a clear night and being able to see the stars and being able to see the moon really full and clear. I love that. Honey, I love babies. I've always loved them, even when I was little. Like I always wanted to stay near them and play with them and stuff. Um, and honey, I love books. I love reading with you guys, even though reading was something that was hard for me when I was younger. Not that I couldn't read, but sometimes I read really slow, but I always loved books because I like to think about what was happening in the story and imagine. So those are just some of the things that I love. Well, my friends, wait a minute, where's my books? Okay, let me get them. We are at the end of Miss Hope's reading hour, and we got to read three awesome books today. Two about two amazing women, Shirley Chisholm and Ella Baker, and about this little Miss Honey saying, Honey, I love, except for going to sleep, okay? But before we go, I want to remind you, I am going to put up um, so that you all can vote on Facebook and on Instagram. Hopefully, if you um, can get over to the Facebook group or the Instagram page, you can vote on there as well. Or you can make a comment on YouTube or Periscope to let me know which book you would prefer. But the two books are... The Unteachables by Gordon Corman, and then Patina, um, Patty Ain't No Junk by Jason Reynolds. Two very awesome books. I'll be honest with you, I have not read completely through both of them, but we will share in that adventure together. We always do, right? So either... Um, the Unteachables by Gordon Corman or Patina, Patty Ain't No Junk by Jason Reynolds. These are our two choices for chapter books. Whichever one gets the most votes is the one that we will start 
on March the 1st, okay? Well, my friends, it was so great being here with you today on this wonderful Wednesday. I hope that you have a great thankful Thursday and you find many things to be thankful for. And I will see you right back here on our fabulous Friday broadcast, which will be, I believe, our last one of the month of February of Black History Month and Love Month. And I will see you on that fabulous Friday right back here on Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Until then, my friends, have a good evening. Enjoy the rest of your wonderful Wednesday, and I will see you back here on Fabulous Friday. Until next time.